So hello everyone, my name is Constantin and I'm liaison officer on Franco-Russian dialogue on climate change at Youth Innova Mat Europe. So today I will be the moderator of this discussion and I'm very pleased to be here at the French Pavilion and I would like to thank the Dialogue du Trianon and l'Institut Français for giving us this opportunity to present the work of French and Russian youth as part of the Franco-Russian dialogue on climate change project. So as a quick introduction, we could say that uh, this dialogue aims to empower and uh, connect the French and Russian youth to become the voice of the change that we need by one, developing ideas and projects to tackle the climate change emergency, and secondly, to raise concerns to the political actors in their countries. So this project was supported by two major actors. On one hand, the Dialogue du Trianon, initiated by President Putin and Macron in 2017, and um, which intends to build a stronger relationship between Russia and France and civil societies. And on the other hand, Youth and Environment Europe, an European NGO which works on climate change issues and um, raising awareness and also strengthening participation in environmental climate decision-making processes. So before telling you more about the project, I would like to present the speakers today. So first, uh, we have Marion, a student in env environmental policy and head of the biodiversity working group e at IEE. Then Anna, uh, head in sustainable transport, and also Valerie, a Russian biologist, a student, and they were both participants and now ambassadors of the project, and they will present in more detail our proposition for biodiversity. So uh, Manon, uh, Marion, excuse me, could you please uh, tell us more about uh, the, this project? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Uh, so the Franco-Russian dialogue united uh, 50 young people aged between 18 and 30 years old and coming from France and Russia. So the main um, activity that we've done during this project is uh, what we call online dialogues where YAE trainees but also experts cover so four different themes. So it was biodiversity, uh, sustainable energy, smart cities and the Arctic. Um, so the goal for this online dialogue, and so it was really an opportunity for the participant to broaden and share the knowledge, but you know also be engaged in a debate to develop, uh, well, to co-develop solutions. Um, so because of this project, so we they constructed what we called a policy paper. So now you're going to ask me what is the policy paper and how of this work. So basically, after the online dialogues, we created four working groups, um, you know, corresponding to the four theme covered, and each participant had the possibility to join one or more working group. Um, and the task of the working group was to create five proposals of what they wanted from the French and Russian government to do in the next 20 years. So I can proudly say that uh, after six months of hard work, we were able to publish our 100 pages long uh, policy paper composed of our 20 proposal for the next 20 years. And I think what's really important to understand about this project is that it really showed the willingness of the youth to be more involved in political action regarding climate change mitigation. Um, and another important thing is that although it is trying to be based on scientific facts as much as possible, it, all, it is also a reflection of what the youth found the most urgent action to take on. So we are still young, we are not yet experts, uh, and our work can always be improved, mainly thanks to your help as well in intervention and discussion. But we believe that our voices should be heard and that this policy paper is the first step to achieve that. Um, and so before concluding about the project itself, uh, we also co-organized what we called a civil society meeting, which is a gathering of the participant, but also activists, um, scientists, policymakers, and other stakeholders. And so that was, you know, really an opportunity to open an intergenerational uh, discussion about climate change. Thank you, Marion. And so as you understood, we are here to present our policy paper focused on our biodiversity proposition. And now Anna will present the first one. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Constantin. Hi, everyone. So uh, thanks to biodiversity experts that gave us a lecture about biodiversity, we were able to identify the main issues regarding biodiversity. That is to say, ecosystem services loss, invasive species, pollution, but also overexploitation of natural resources. And that is this last one that I'm going to detail you right now. 
So what is overexploitation? Uh, overexploitation is a stage at which uh, the withdrawal of natural resources that are difficult or expensive to renew exceeds the renewal stage. This means that the stock of vital resources will decrease uh, if we continue to exploit them until there's nothing left. And that is quite frightening. Uh, so I had a question for you. Do you know what is the percentage of forest cover that has been degraded in the last three decades? 20%, 50%, 80%? Well, 80% is the correct figure, and that's huge. Um, but overexploitation has many other disastrous and irreversible consequences that we must be conscious about. So as we said, a uh, major decrease in the earth stock of natural resources, soil erosion, but also the destruction of biodiversity habitats, loss of ecosystem services such as CO2 regulation and climate change effects like landslide, violent storm, or the rise of sea level. So some of these impacts are already visible now, as we witnessed last summer all over the world with the latest mega fire and heavy rainfall, and also this week in the United States and India. Yeah, exactly, Anna. And we also know that the IPCC recently, recently drew the worst scenario ever regarding the rise of temperature, so which only forces us to drastically decrease uh, our overconsumption. So we have a duty to the next generation, but also to this generation that is already facing the consequences of our action. So as, you know, participant of the project and YEE members, we are representing both generation, and we fear the aftermath of this overconsumption. So that is why we are now going to present six action, or you can say proposition, regarding the food industry and forest management. So our first proposition is to develop fallow land system and improve fishing quotas. So this solution came from the idea of restoring biodiversity as our current agriculture system overexploited. So we propose to make mandatory the use of fallow land system for all farms. Thanks to the studies we've read, we propose that 10% of uh, farmland should be left in farm for a year uh, to let the ecosystem time to regenerate itself uh, and to allow this system and the, to be fair also for the companies, uh, subsidies should be provided for all, uh, all small farms uh, to set up this uh, system. On the other end, we think that a better regulation on the quotas for algaic resources is needed in international organization, and not only for threatened species, but for all species that could be a threat in the next decades. And to enable this, we advise the two countries, French, France and Russia, to forbid imports uh, of algaic resources from countries that do not respect uh, quotas and do not control their fish industry. Yeah, and to complete what's been said about agriculture, our second proposition, as you can see, is about raising awareness about the meat consumption. So we feel that there is a need for the population to be aware about the environmental but also sanitary consequences of eating too much meat. But more than that, less meat would mean uh, you know, less uh, pressure on farmlands but also avoid deforestation and maybe diminish the risk of uh, future pandemic events. Hopefully not. Uh, and as lands need time to, rege to regenerate themselves, so does phytic tables. Uh, so therefore, our superposition is to encourage companies to save water and reduce the pressure on phytic table. The idea is to sanction industries that use an excessive amount of water in their industrial process without any uh, solution to recycle it. It, this could be done through a better control system or bonus system for uh, the companies to set up, uh, which set up water resource plan and drastically reduce the amount of water they use from one year to another. And so our next proposition about forest, because we know how forest is very important for CO2 regulation. So we firstly thought about, you know, having more exchange about the, big pra the best practice of climate change mitigation. And that could be done with Russian and French scientists, but also forest owners. So we can think about having more pitland or, you know, develop the forest albedo and having more variety of trees um, according to the region specificities. And then we thought about, you know, having um, so improve the adaptability adaptability and resilience of forests due to future fire forests. And as we saw this summer, most countries are not yet ready to face those 
catastrophes. So we want more and efficient means to prevent those fire, but also to develop those reparative strategies. And so our final proposition on the biodiversity working group is to reinforce forest protection. Thus, we propose to extend uh, the network of protected area, and especially on the Boreal Forest of Russia that we studied, that is a hotspot of biodiversity, but threatened by overexploitation. We also propose to normalize sustainable forest uh, management in national action plan, and also to deliver more uh, sustainable management of forest labels uh, for forest owners uh, with the help of independent bodies that would uh, advise them on uh, sustainable practices. Finally, we would like to reinforce strategies like the French uh, national strategy on imported deforestation uh, and also police control to banish the import of wood products uh, that have been obtained from illegal and unsustainable practices. So as we know, another consequence of overexploitation is the loss of ecosystem services that we solely need to survive. And Fighting against it is covered by our next proposition that will be presented by Valerie from Kaliningrad. Hello, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Continuing the focus on environmental problems, uh, it's important to remember that the biodiversity um, suffers most from environmental problems and uh, that we are directly depend uh, on other magnificent force of forms of life just like bees and other pollinators more than 70 percent of food crops need pollination and uh, bees themselves are doing uh, already doing their job uh, from end of dinosaur period uh, uh, but now they are in great danger, uh, just like other pollinators, the overusing of insecticides and destruction of uh, their environment uh, lead to decreasing of uh, number of pollinators in certain regions of Europe and Asia. But the trend is uh, already global and uh, the disappearance of this assistance may undermine the ability of our agriculture to meet uh, the needs of growing and in, um, increasingly huge human population. We need to protect our pollinators because we depend uh, on them and recognize their role uh, that they play in supporting our food systems as well as world biodiversity. Yes, and you, as you might have guessed, we come up with some ideas to just do that. So we need more scientific research and monitoring of pollinators in specific region, but globally as well. Um, so we need more data on population biology and how we can save them. So we can support them by, you know, identifying their key habitat, key location, and protect their food bases. Um, but also it's very important to protect the breeding grounds of insects and take care of it, their habitat, and that could be by developing wild mildews between fields and of course another important thing to do you know is changing our farming methods so that would mean for example biologically protect our field from pests or you know reduce monoculture or um, doing crop um, what is the thing uh, 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 crop rotation but also having those very highly effective methods that allowed us to grow those plants in smaller areas. Um, and to do so, we need education. We need education in kindergarten and in university. And, and finally, the last thing to, well, that is also important, is to work with those small business businesses and help them in this transition to more environmental friendly farming methods. Yes, and um, if we are talking about the uh, disappearance of pollinators, it's one of the part of the food problem. Humanity, all their history, uh, has consumed and used animals for different purposes. And now we are experiencing a biodiversity crisis and people are becoming a big problem. Uh, many wild animals, including their body parts, are in great demand from different uses, for example, in China. 
more than 1500 animal species have medical value in uh, traditional Chinese medicine, but um, without any real medicine solutions. For example, tiger bones or ivory or something uh, just like that. Uh, now the problem is poaching. Uh, it's problem very huge and uh, in far east of Russia causes in terrible danger to the biodiversity of uh, uh, some regions of the world and uh, which uh, is under pressure. With uh, the advent of social media, another problem uh, spread the trait of wild animal as pets, which leads to increase of poaching and together with wet markets where wild animals are sold, uh, it may be source for future pandemics. For example, uh, just now, according to World Health Organization, up to the 70% of the uh, zoonosis or in other names is uh, um, infections uh, hum which come from wild animal come from uh, wild animals from wet markets and uh, it's a big problem. These zoonoses pass to us more frequently as we come to the close contact with wild animals, which happens more now. And it's likely that future zoonoses will be include new viruses of new RNI viruses, just like today the SARS-CoV-2. And we need to strain the control of trade of wild animals and uh, parts of this is wild animals. Uh, prohibit people from keeping primates, bats and other epidemic danger animals to keep at home and uh, uh, carry out the epidemic control, of course. We also should support local populations and exchange environmental experiences between countries, Russia and France and, and other countries. For us, it's necessary to create more nature reserves because we don't have a lot. Uh, for France, uh, it's very important to implement uh, control of the, of the trade in wild animals and, of course, pay attention to this problem in social media. We can also work with zoos and other EASA members on this topic because one of the missions of the modern zoos is education uh, people and many uh, modern zoos in Europe and some in Russia are engaging in education society in this field. Thank you. Thank you for these highlights. And we also wanted to briefly introduce you our four other proposition uh, from the Biodiversity Working Group. Well, as you might have heard and understand throughout our speech, raising awareness is a great and consistent topic throughout our policy paper. So when we found that only 20% of people believe that biodiversity is an important major uh, like concerns in the country, and 20% is not a lot, we thought that it should be you know, the topic of one of our proposition. And to fight that or tackle this, we thought that it was important to raise awareness about the action of the OFB and RPM, but also really empower this community and give them tools through their community leaders to raise awareness. And then another good idea, well, I hope it's good, I believe it is, is you know, to make ecotourism a tool so that biodiversity is a real subject. Um, and so another thing that we thought about and try to tackle is pollution. So by tackling the air, plastic and agricultural pollution. So you can find some of our, our ideas and solutions on the policy paper. But for example, that could be from fighting single use object and, and to you know, change our transport and agriculture methods. And on a more specific note, we propose to encourage innovation and ethical technologies for wood processing in Far East Russia uh, and give more visibility to initiatives such as the use of wood waste and the development of biodegradable um, glue system that would both ensure a better management of forest and respect of wildlife. Finally, we tackled the problem of invasive species that are mainly due to global trade and travel. The species can threaten environmental safety as they cause billions of dollars of damages. 
and therefore we propose a better management of invasive species throughout international cooperation, uh, the development of studies on the subject and support of technical initiative in the field. Yes, so climate change is impacting biodiversity, but the French and Russian youth believe that we need to protect that biodiversity because it would help us you know, cope with all the changes and maybe reduce the impact of the changes. But moreover, it would help us to thrive in harmony with nature in future. So as I, you might remember at the beginning of the speech, I said that our policy paper was the first step for our voice to be heard. So naturally, the next step is for us to promote our policy paper, and we know that's going to take a lot of action. So we want to try to organize different meetings with stakeholders, decision makers, and really, you know, talked about our proposition and always improve. Um, but also, we want to campaign. We want to be present at even like this. Uh, we want to also have a very efficient online communication strategy. So that's the, the future of our project for now. Yes, thank you. And so we believe with the Dialogue du Trianon and Youth and Environment Europe that this project is the first step for cooperation in environmental field between France and Russia. And to conclude, we wanted to present a short video with other participants from the project that wanted to, to add a last comment on why they get involved in this project. So please launch the video. <laughs> In Russia, we are seeing the effects of the climate change right now. So in order to save the current and future generations, we also have to act now. We should act against climate change because it is not only a problem that developing countries have to face. And I think that climate change is super serious and only by collaboration with other nations we can solve. Maybe we've lost our opportunity to avoid warming climate. There is still time to act. Нам важно, чтобы Россия предприняла более активные действия в борьбе с изменением климата. Et je prends l'action collective de la France et de la Russie pour mener des actions contre le réchauffement climatique. I like the landscapes of my motherland and the diversity of its nature. That is why I am fighting against climate change. Thank you. Good evening everybody. So, I am Frédéric Giguet. I'm a professor at the Natural History Museum and for many years now I've been working on migratory birds, studying their behavior and their future. And I'm Hélène Pérez. I'm an agronomist and I work for the Ministry of Armies where I work on environmental policy. This evening we are going to be presenting to you a research project that was dreamt up by the Ministry of the Army, which was to help populations who were impacted by hurricanes in the Pacific. And we were wondering if we couldn't take advantage of that sixth sense that animals have to help us better to predict natural catastrophes, to anticipate them better, so that we can either uh, prevent damage from being incurred or so that we could take help there more quickly. So we launched uh, this project, a joint project, a research project. We equip migratory birds with, um, detect with balises, with detectors, so that they can uh, give feedback information. And we are trying to use these birds as sentinels to detect these catastrophes. So we started out in last January. And we're going to start by showing you a film which has been made by the armed forces in French Polynesia. And the film describes the program and this first expedition. On a récupéré à bord une équipe de scientifiques depuis l'atoll de, de, de Fakarava. C'est une grosse expérience de travailler avec euh, la marine et les baleiniers. Ce projet qui va nous aider à anticiper les catastrophes naturelles fait partie de, de nos missions. 
on a pu découvrir la vie des marins sur un bâtiment de la Marine Nationale. Dans le cadre de notre mission de surveillance maritime, eh ben on, on s'est associé à cette mission pour les déposer d'atoll en atoll euh, avec, euh, avec des moyens dédiés à ça pour leur permettre de se projeter sur les différents atolls qui sont parfois assez inaccessibles et assez reculés. Sur le Bougainville, on a pu bénéficier des services de, des baleiniers avec une baleinière pour nous déposer sur chaque atoll et pour pouvoir changer de motu petite île, hein, jour après jour, afin de, de trouver les meilleurs sites pour procéder aux captures d'alimicoles. On a une baleinière qui est une embarcation typique du coin, à fond plat. Euh, alors, elles, elles, sont, elles sont maintenant en aluminium, elles ne sont plus en bois comme elles pouvaient l'être autrefois. Et ces embarcations permettent de franchir euh, les barrières de corail, puisque certains atolls n'ont pas de passe. Donc le Bougainville, avec son tirant d'eau de 4 mètres 20, ne peut pas rentrer dans certains atolls. Et cette baleinière permet de franchir, euh, franchir les barrières de corail pour déposer les scientifiques sur les différents atolls. Kivikuaka, c'est un programme de recherche qui va étudier les réponses comportementales des oiseaux aux catastrophes naturelles. On sait que certains oiseaux, notamment les grands migrateurs, sont très sensibles aux infrasons et on veut savoir si ces oiseaux migrateurs qui viennent passer la mauvaise saison en Polynésie pourraient servir dans les systèmes d'alerte précoce aux tsunamis et aux cyclones. Pour ça, on va poser des balises GPS sur des oiseaux qui enregistrent des données météo et leur position GPS et on espère pouvoir étudier donc, le lien entre le déplacement de ces oiseaux lors de leur migration et les événements climatiques pour prévenir au plus tôt les tsunamis par exemple. Et on a parcouru différents atolls de l'archipel des Tuamotu où on déposait ces scientifiques, ils faisaient de la capture de ces oiseaux, ils les baguaient dans un premier temps puis ils les balisaient. Les balises GPS que l'on pose sur ces oiseaux communiquent leurs données via la Station Spatiale Internationale. Comme elle est à basse altitude, environ 400 km, il y a besoin de beaucoup moins d'énergie pour transmettre les données par ondes radio. Et donc on a ainsi pu miniaturiser la balise qui ne pèse que 5 grammes et que l'on peut poser sur des espèces de petite taille. Les scientifiques nous ont montré tout leur système de capture des oiseaux. Donc c'est des grands filets qui déploient où l'oiseau vient se prendre dedans, des, des systèmes de clapnet, c'est comme des pièges à loup où l'oiseau se prend les pieds dans un fil et le piège se referme sur lui. Alors, Kiwi Kwaka, en fait, ça fait référence au, à deux des espèces d'oiseaux qu'on souhaite équiper. Donc Kiwi, qui, veut dire, qui est le courli d'Alaska, donc c'est le nom polynésien de cette espèce-là, et Kwaka, qui signifie barge rousse en maori. Vous vous rendez compte si en, en appareillant des, des oiseaux, en surveillant leur, leur comportement, on arrive à anticiper des, des catastrophes naturelles comme des cyclones et des tsunamis. C'est un côté euh, innovateur euh, extraordinaire qui nous rappelle euh, Bougainville. C'est pour moi une grande valeur symbolique puisque le nom du bateau euh, vient d'un grand marin du XVIIIe siècle, Louis-Antoine de Bougainville, qui a fait la première circumnavigation autour du monde et a embarqué déjà à son époque des équipes de scientifiques. Donc il, il a notamment euh, décrit Tahiti, qu'il appelait la nouvelle citerre dans la baie d'Itia quand il est arrivé au XVIIIe siècle à Tahiti. Et donc nous, on perpétue un peu cette tradition, donc je pense que pour l'équipage, c'est un symbole assez fort et je pense qu'on devrait continuer à s'engager parce que c'est très enrichissant et puis c'est passionnant. J'ai hâte maintenant qu'on ait les données GPS dans nos ordinateurs, qu'on puisse voir ça et vraiment mieux comprendre et aller plus loin dans ce projet. So there we go, that was our film. And now I'm going to make you a short presentation to explain the research section of our program, the scientific part. The starting point was a radio program by Jean-Luc Amezen. It's called On Darwin's Shoulders, that's the English version. And I listened to a soldier, Jérôme Chardon, whilst he was trying to do safety operations by the French army in Southeast Asia, he heard that these birds called the bar-tailed uh, barwit would uh, fly all the way to New Zealand. It would take them a week. They wouldn't stop. If there was a cyclone on the path, then the barwit, the, the bar-tailed barwits would di divert and they'd avoid it. So that was the starting point. 
And then uh, he started to contact some researchers into migratory birds and saying, would it not be possible for these birds who are sensitive to these storms, could these migratory birds and other animals perhaps, but mostly these migratory birds, might they be sensitive to the infra uh, sounds produced by the uh, earthquakes and waves, etc. And perhaps they would perceive them uh, much more in advance of this uh, of this ecological um, catastrophe. There, there were rarely um, animals damaged in a, in a tidal wave, for example. Recently in Thailand there was that uh, tidal wave. No elephants were hurt at all because there could be something there, sensitivity to infrasound, for example, that would warn them in advance and enable them to escape, to run away and to take shelter. So the theory is simply a hypothesis. We want to check it with our program. Some studies have already been carried out, which have found some interesting things. There's this tiny, tiny bird here from uh, South America. It's a hurricane. You can see a hurricane, here, a hurricane here, and the birds set off to the south, looped round it, and came back to their um, nesting site after the hurricane had had gone on. So they didn't have any uh, weather reports, uh, but they knew hundreds of kilometers downstream, they knew that something was happening and they knew that they shouldn't stay where they were. So the technology we use is quite unique. These GPS tags can be added to the animals. And so we use a GPS system, uh, we record the data and we can transmit that uh, uh, information really quickly and that if that's necessary if we hope to predict a natural catastrophe so the data is transmitted by the Argus uh, satellites which are, which are high up in the sky so they the, they require a lot of energy or we could use uh, the mobile phone network instead which uh, is we don't have mobile phone networks in um, the zones where the birds are going to be so we use a technology which is currently being uh, um, developed in Germany and by the Russian Space Agency and these are Icarus tags which transmit um, data through the European Space Agency. The uh, space station has got a special aerial and that uh, receives the information. It's currently uh, it's an ongoing project. We're getting a little bit of data every day. It's still not yet uh, at a rate of uh, information being sent from the birds every minute, but uh, we're getting there. So we checked that we were talking about migratory birds that were in the area in that period of year when cyclones occur in Southeast Asia, and that enabled us to identify the target um, birds that we wanted to work with. So we chose the bar-tailed bullwit, but there are others. This uh, another bird which is only in Alaska. It's on the red list of the uh, UIC IUCN. And uh, there is a, a, you can see it on the screen there, the uh, tsunami zones. And here we have a map of earthquakes, major earthquakes that have occurred recently. So we're here with the Triangle of uh, Polynesia. It's a very high risk zone. So the different uh, species which we um, identified are on the screen here. One from Alaska, there's the famous bar-tailed barwick, which we talk, talked about, the limicola, the limicoles, and the tags are very light, so we can put them on very, very tiny birds. So we can uh, use a different uh, kinds of bird. So the first mission took place in January 2021 in uh, Little Moitou, uh, partnering with of the French Navy because we were taxied about the place between different uninhabited islands. So we were on a boat called the Bougainville and we were able to benefit from their logistics to reach these out of the way sites. Here's one of the islands where we managed to fit a lot of uh, tags. Another island here, you can see our base camp. That's on on a blue lagoon there. That's where we did uh, where we managed to catch a lot of birds, and so we really. I'm showing you this photo. 
in the month of August, between the 17th and 19th of August, there was a huge storm with a lot of swell in the sea, and all of uh, all of our that area where our tents are now it was underwater. And so you can imagine with sea level rising, with storms, uh, tsunamis, uh, and all of these little islands that are only one or two meters above sea water level will be disappearing quite soon. So we use different uh, techniques to capture the birds. We had to develop those techniques. We were busy doing that we, we tagged about 50 birds. Here you have the bird from Alaska, which has already been ringed with a number. And so we can uh, control that from uh, remotely. And then they've got the tag on its back. We've got one bird, which was seen in Hawaii. And we could identify it thanks to the number it has on its ring around its leg. Here you can see a little red flag that is the tag on this a second bird. We want to carry out an uh, analysis. Of course, we're not looking forward to the next uh, catastrophe. However, if it does occur, we'll be ready to study the uh, bird's behavior. So what will happen? We don't know. Maybe the nothing would happen. Maybe birds don't uh, uh, perceive infrasounds and they will have no reaction whatsoever to the catastrophe. A second possibility, they will go uh, into uh, toward the interland or they will uh, fly away and uh, uh, come back once uh, the uh, storm has gone. Another study made on marine birds has shown that uh, some, when there's a storm coming, uh, some specific birds, they fly upwards, uh, they wait for the storm or the cyclone to go away and they come back down. Obviously, we don't want birds to go on the spot, collect data who will be transmitted to a satellite and then to researchers. No, we will uh, go through a whole process with this uh, analysis, data analysis process with birds equipped with uh, tags. There will be one uh, computer working 24 hours to analyze the bird's localization. And if all birds behave uh, weirdly, strangely, the computer uh, will supplement uh, classical warnings issued when there is an earthquake or a tidal wave. Uh, we have created a website dedicated to our uh, warning uh, system. You can uh, check uh, the uh, localization of all our birds. Uh, you can also uh, have a look at different pictures about the project. And you can check, as I said, the uh, localization to see uh, of birds to see where they are. The some birds have uh, migrated, they went away, then they came back to uh, where they were, so you can follow their tracks. And if you're really interested in uh, these uh, operations, uh, Leo Grasset from the uh, YouTube Dirty Biology channel, so he published uh, two uh, different videos about our project. Uh, and especially about what, uh, what what happened in January. So here are all, all our partners and our funding partners. The Ministry of the Army has supported us since the beginning, but we also partner with the Ministry for of the Ecological uh, Transition and, of course, the museum. Now you will hear the presentation of my colleague. Uh, she works for the Ministry of the Army. And uh, this is Hélène Perret. Thank you very much, Frédéric. I will try to show you a, a connection, the connection between biodiversity and the Ministry of Army. I will also tell you how we came to fund such a project uh, uh, and I'll start with the initiative uh, taken by Leon Charon that we mentioned uh, earlier. 
So let me give you a few general information about the ministry. Uh, we uh, uh, cover 275,000 actors in mainland France and in the overseas, and 80% of uh, this area gather some uh, classified areas. Uh, there are various uh, classified areas. As you can see, we cover many areas and they're not equal uh, uh, in the field of biodiversity. That's what we are trying to show uh, at the moment, but that's uh, not a surprise since the Ministry of the Army hasn't been uh, hasn't been influenced by business. There, there, there are no farming activities. We, we, we're not responsible for uh, all these activities that can have a, a very a serious impact on biodiversity. Uh, we face a, a significant challenge in the mainland because our uh, presence is well distributed over the uh, French territory. And so we managed to uphold our corridors. So as you know, corridors help us uh, ensure that species are traveling, circulating, and are maintained. So we face a really complex challenge because we uh, have a really rich biodiversity. We have launched different initiatives for protecting biodiversity these past 20 years, and uh, we also have uh, life uh, programs since 2012 with 1.6 million euros budget allocated to biodiversity yearly. We also undertake operational mission who directly contribute to uh, protecting uh, biodiversity from uh, pollution with many uh, Navy uh, members, many uh, sailors uh, working on it. We try to fight against illegal fishing, and we do uh, help uh, monitor marine protected areas. So I, ha I haven't mentioned our migratory birds yet. I will, but first let me talk about security and defense in the field of climate change. As you all know, there is a connection between biodiversity and climate change. There are no evidence yet, but climate change and its impact could aggravate tension, existing uh, tensions. There could be more conflicts, aggravated conflicts, terrorism, which mean new challenges or higher challenges for uh, the army. And so we could face new health risks too. Like for example, insects could transmit many more diseases than before in specific areas. Our infrastructure could become more vulnerable to the rise of the sea level, for example. So we need to anticipate this risk in mainland, in the mainland and in the overseas as well as abroad because we do have uh, our some uh, soldiers deployed abro abroad. That's uh, why we also uh, work uh, uh, to uh, know uh, more, to know the ocean better. We need to enhance our monitoring of the oceans. So all these risks can impact our forces as well as our capacities. We cannot deploy our army everywhere at the same time. And if there's an increasing number of extreme weather events, we'll need to send an increasing number of troops. So we need to anticipate this. We need to find a strategical way to anticipate this risk and we need to form partnerships because we cannot act alone. Following the initiative taken by Guillaume Chardon, we have uh, turned towards a concept that is called the anticipation, the environmental anticipation. Uh, 
through security. So we want to enhance a dialogue between different countries before catastrophes occur. However, our capacities are limited. We cannot act everywhere, so we need to minimize the number, minimize conflict. And when there's a conflict, we uh, cannot carry out uh, environmental protection actions. So we need, we are trying to, uh, to, uh, to maintain security. And we work with uh, scientists but not only biologists, we can also work with uh, uh, economics, as ec ec economists. We need an international uh, dialogue based on a scientific target. This scientific target will be to preserve di biodiversity. The Ministry of the Army has taken three measures. Uh, first, the setting up of an observatory that's where we carry out all our studies on uh, biodiversity vulnerability. We have started uh, conferences in Southeast Asia that uh, gathers uh, different professions, uh, different uh, sectors, the army as well as businesses. Thirdly, we have scientific programs in order to make progress on a specific area. That's how we have funded the Kiwi Kwaka project. Along with another one, we allocated 400,000 euros to Kiwi Kwaka. This journey is just starting. There will be other projects. This uh, concept will be developed in the future, and we will give you uh, information we will tell you how it goes in the future but the Kiwi Kwaka project aims to create an early detection uh, system to conclude I'll say that yes it is our main target tagged birds collect uh, weather uh, weather data where the data in areas where there are no observation posts for uh, official weather forecast. So uh, I am talking here about areas where there are no, where, where nobody goes and birds can go there and collect data every day. And they will help the National Meteorology Weather Agency uh, predict the weather. In January, we uh, launched a mission and we visited four islands. It had been visited before by an American team, and we have uh, we found 30 to 40 percent of the, uh, the the birds, the amount of birds that were registered uh, before. The birds from uh, Alaska that we showed you before, so as I said, uh, the number of Alaska birds were redu was reduced. And this kind of bird could be useful locally to uh, Polynesia. This bird could help Polynesians protect themselves from future uh, catastrophes because now we've got a new tool. So the main message we'd like to convey is that we have to protect biodiversity. We need this heritage of ecosystems. And with this tool, we can also show people that if specific species disappear, we might not know about it. We might not know about all the species that have or are disappear or will disappear. So this tool could be useful in the future, and uh, we want to uh, say it out loud. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to everybody. I am in charge of uh, the INRAE. 
we uh, focus on researching into agriculture and the environment. We have a 30-minute session together to uh, give you some feedback on the main scientific messages that were uh, emitted during the meeting that was uh, in the reimagine area. So it was uh, with the Minister for Food and Agriculture, the Minister for the Environment, in researchers from three institutions, and I represent uh, INRE, the IRD, and the CIRAD. So in the name of those three organizations, I'm going to lead this roundtable to share with you and to share with our panelists the main conclusions of a roundtable and to look forward to the aftermath of the World Congress to imagine what's going to happen for COP15 and what's going to go on after COP15. So we have uh, four people on the panel. A fifth person might be joining us later. So we've got Elisabeth Clavry de Saint-Martin, who is uh, from the CIRAD. Jean, uh, we have someone who is representing INRE, Valérie Verdier, General Director of the IRD, and Luc Labourdier of the UCN of the IUCN, who is specializing, uh, specializing in, oh, we have our fifth member who is with us there, Lilkas, who is in charge of uh, the French Development Agency. So to launch our roundtable, the main messages which we concluded last night in our roundtable, these are things which are scientific scientists are able to produce now are the links between agriculture and uh, uh, biodiversity and how we can uh, conclude them, how we can make them live side by side. I'm just going to say that we're not going to call into question this consensus, but to say given that we've got a consensus, it was described yesterday, so how can we now use scientific knowledge in light of uh, COP15, we've we're going to have a, a, a meeting next October. And then so it's the serious uh, business is going to start in 2022 with the definition of new uh, goals for biodiversity between now and 2030. And one of the motions that are going to be discussed in the General Assembly is developing agroecological solutions as, solu as uh, nature-based solutions so that we can combine biodiversity management and farming, agriculture. So I want to ask them for their reaction on those conclusions. And I want to imagine, ask them how they can imagine we can get research organizations, funding agencies, and international organizations working together to bring a new dimension to these questions, whether we're talking about satellite events around COP or, or other events. And I think that's what we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to put back on the screen just to remind us those main messages which uh, we uh, came up with yesterday. Uh, I'm not going to read them out because I haven't got enough time. But uh, perhaps we can, Ludovic is going to tell us in the first instance, uh, the IUCN, what's your reaction to these messages from the research world on the link between agriculture, biodiversity uh, and the environment? The main reaction is that we are talking about thought processes which are very close. Uh, at the IUCN, we would like to react to the first two points that have been highlighted here. The first thought which comes to mind, which might give structure to the debate, is that the IUCN's relationship to uh, our common ground there was a survey which was published about a year ago. Uh, biodiversity is a structuring element for productivity and resilience of farms. So that is bringing a, an alternative type of message. We're not satisfying ourselves with uh, simply talking about farming which can be harmful or which can have an impact on biodiversity but we want to underline the richness of biodiversity in farming systems a wealth which helps to provide services to society 
to the farming production system by enhancing water retention, recycling fertilizers, uh, soil structure. They're all absolutely vital for agricultural production that can resist or withstand climate change because we know the climate is changing, particularly in the most vulnerable countries. So the first uh, thought with, from the point of view of an environmental organization is to stop naming and shaming, stop pointing the finger, stop being accusational at farmers, but to get closer to the farming world and say that we are going to work hand in hand with you, we are going to work with you to improve and to make more durable and to make more resilient all of the farming systems for the long term in light of global warming. The second point is that this also means that we have to consider farmers as partners. They are, how can we put this? I'm looking for my words here. What's the right word to use? They are responsible, if you like, for protecting agricultural biodiversity on their farms. And this awareness has not yet been embraced yet. We're having to uh, construct that by, through our farming teaching uh, and uh, popularizing the notions of farming. We have to make sure that farmers re realize they are responsible for this and that they can recognize opportunities. Farmers can become the protectors, not only of their own durability, looking to the future, but also they can provide vital services to society. So that was the second point. And the third point, my final point, is that we want to encourage a dialogue between the environment, the world of the environment, and the farming world. And that dialogue must be encouraged nationally, internationally, as we prepare for great events and great uh, international meetings so that we end up with consensual policies so that we can reduce conflict between the farming world and the environmental world and so that we can develop tools to help with decision taking to help guide where we should be investing public and private funds in initiatives which uh, are best for biodiversity, but also to develop tools to ensure that we are able to monitor and to assess the impact of these policies on biodiversity. And that's a bit of a challenge because uh, we don't have those metrics yet. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ludovic. Let's hand the floor to Brigitte Fez because this uh, summary, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things have been said about uh, temperate climes. What about ex exotic climes, tropical climes? It's, it's slightly different. So it's a kind of dialogue that Ludovic has been mentioning to bringing the farming world close to the world of conservation. Is that tricky for a development agency? Well, I think that we agree about the fact that rural territories and uh, small family farms that, uh, uh, that uh, represent the majority of farming businesses around the world, I think we have to be very prudent about simplifying the matter. If we want diversity, we want to enrich it, we want to promote it in farming lands. It's not the same kind of diversity that you're going to have in where the land is not cultivated and, and developed. I don't want to get into the scientific debate here about what you can produce, what you can conserve, or using land sharing, for example, and having a rich mosaic of agricultural lands taking into consideration protected species. What we're interested in as a development agency and as a bank is how we can fund environmental and social uh, performance in farming. And that is a very uh, 
important question. When we were taking a look at all of the financial flows, the positive flows for biodiversity, there are about 150 billion uh, a year around the world. On the other side of the uh, balance sheet, all of the funding for farming, more or less, is harmf harmful to biodiversity. So you said there's 500 billion, which is harmful to uh, biodiversity, then that means that we've got 400 million of uh, European um, subventions for intensive farming. So public policy is specifically funding biodiversity in, uh, in, uh, in, in rural environments, and it's quite tricky. I don't know if you have in mind those biodiversity performance assessments in rural um, environments, all different kinds of aspects of that. When you assess that, the results are very ambivalent. Uh, the results are too low given the amount of money that's invested. So we manage public funds. We purchase impacts on society, on the environment. And so we have to wonder about what kind of farming we're going to fund and uh, how can we be sure that uh, we are optimizing uh, bi biodiversity in these different regions? And so it, it, we haven't got the answers yet. We'll be able to come back to that in a short while. We've heard this call for dialogue. We've heard how difficult it is to assess actions. And this is a problem that uh, research also has, uh, the problem of anticipation and uh, driving towards different themes, helping the transition. I've got a, a question for our next speaker, the CIRAD, pertaining to what uh, we have to look forward to in the future, COP15 and the rest. Thank you very much, Terry. I would say that it's a continuation of what Gilles has already put forward. The first point, well, I had a walk around yesterday and I heard lots of people talking about transforming farming. I was with the Minister for Agriculture and the Secretary of State for Biodiversity yesterday and they're talking about transforming farming to protect or to restore biodiversity but that's not so simple and the scientists can tell you that. There are questions of the soil, there are technical and economic and social questions. Um, my uh, colleague from INRE is far better qualified to talk about that than me here in Europe, but even more to the, to the point in the South. And transformation requires science and time. It's not getting back to ancestral farming techniques. That is not the solution. We are trying to produce um, science at, our, at the institute where I work, and we uh, have uh, impacts woven into our commitments to the authorities and so we have to start thinking about how we can work well and how we can analyze our own contribution we've got a method called impress and we try to assess our impact we do it after we've worked but we try to do it before we do it as well and as Gilles has mentioned we really need to work in all areas we need to be working in applied sciences we need to help public policy makers we need to work with all of the different players and with the farmers whoever they are small farmers from the south but also we need to ask what the agribusiness is doing particularly in Africa and how we can change things there so it's very hard for us as an institution. And uh, in a nutshell, I would just say that some things are lacking. We don't have the places, we don't have the fora where we can be even more useful. Let me take a look around at what's going on at the uh, food, system, food system summit. We are very happy that we were able to work together and discuss, but by the same token, we get the feeling that we're still working in silos. You've got the scientists on the one hand, the economists on the other, political deciders in another silo. And for COP15, we have to break that silo system. We're gonna to have to find fora where we can all talk together 
without having to produce any results, but just to say that we all agree, we understand one another, we've all got our mandate, we've all got our functions, science, politics, but if we can manage to do that for COP15 and then for afterwards, then I think we will have advanced a lot. And a second point, we also need to test out in the field. We need to test our projects. We are doing this already and I know it's tricky. It's tricky to set up a biodiversity project. We did so with the FAO and I would like to tell the European Union to wake up. We need to do now what we've done for the climate. We need a boost to the European Union was there when the negotiations were slowing down in Copenhagen. So we have to become the leaders and as scientists, we will of course be with you. Thank you very much, Elisabeth. Valérie Verdi is really active in the uh, countries of the South with interdisciplinary projects that are more and more focused on sustainability. So we talked about agriculture and biodiversity, the links. Is that a priority for your organization? Are we going to work on it? And uh, before the COP15? Yes, I will. Thank you for this uh, question. So for my organization, the RRD, uh, agriculture matters and questions of uh, biodiversity and conserving and the evolution of the biodiversity, we, uh, these issues will be at the center of our attention because our uh, institute uh, carries out a research along with our partners in uh, the south as well as in the overseas and our partners is there also call for more preservation of biodiversity so we are all uh, together ready to act so what do we do on the field well we're uh, among 50 uh, countries in the south and we work with them we implement measures we carry out our operation so that uh, our partners can uh, better act in the field of biodiversity now, I will not repeat what has been already said about the uh, connection between agroecology and biodiversity. However, I feel it is important to, uh, uh, to say, to underline that we need uh, more action and we need to uh, define uh, the uh, limits of science. The, we need to, to know what science will do in the next uh, years, what will be the new biotechnologies. We need to launch a, a reflection, a thought process, especially in the, uh, the South, because they, there the uh, countries can't access the same uh, technologies. And uh, President Macron made important announcements uh, about the reduction of uh, uh, pesticides. He also uh, talked about uh, agriculture, that we uh, preserve nature. He mentioned the protected areas. These ambitions are uh, really uh, good, they're great. But we have a good take on the subject, and that's uh, why we here, uh, all the three uh, of us uh, together, uh, gathered in this uh, session. Now we need to be more united in order to uh, uh, respond, bring answers to farmers and farming. And finally, we have uh, talked about, we mentioned the COP15 and uh, 50 years ago in Stockholm, we uh, had decided uh, we made uh, important decisions for the first time uh, and it is important to remember uh, what happened 50 years ago and to remember that we have deadlines to meet by 2030 and 2050 so that's why uh, I uh, would like the IRD to promote uh, local uh, knowledge and our partners have a better take on their own biodiversity. They know how to protect their own ecosystems. That's why we need uh, our, the voice of our, we need to make our partners' voice heard and to make commitments ahead of the COP15. Jean-Francois, to uh, uh, end this uh, cycle, uh, of this uh, tripartite uh, cycle. Yes, let me just supplement on what uh, m my fellow guests uh, have already said. The INRE is an institute based on agroecology. This is our main uh, subject of expertise, and we are delighted to see that what uh, 
uh, used to be uh, quite uh, complex uh, is evolving, the debate is changing, and now agroecology is a part of nature-based solutions, so that is quite an achievement. And we are uh, one of the latest uh, UICN's initiatives that wants to reconcile farming and biodiversity. So that's a reason for us to rejoice. And there's a convergence between climate uh, challenges and nature-based solutions. That's why I don't quite agree with what's written on the slide, because I think that biodiversity, agroecology, and nature-based solutions uh, have a crucial role to play. And uh, now these concepts are a part of the international debate. So, as you see, we are moving forward. We're moving towards a unified vision about biodiversity and climate. It doesn't mean that our uh, our child the challenges we face with uh, food and with food security are not pressing. And Gilles mentioned the land sparing, and the message was if you turn. So there was a message saying that if you turn towards agroecology, there could be also uh, some uh, very uh, disastrous consequences. So I think uh, that the UICN wants to launch a study, and I believe that researchers must unite the forces to carry out this study with the UICN, we need to assess the uh, indir indirect impact of the of land use on biodiversity. And now here is a, a proposal I wanted uh, to I want to put forward. I haven't had the time to talk about it with my colleagues yesterday, but I wonder if we uh, could assess landscape variations. Biodiversity profiles are based on parcels, but we do know there are specific, that parcels can be very specific and they can help us uh, promote agroecology and make progress so we can observe the biodiversity of different parcels through sat uh, satellite. We could extend a pilot project all over the world, and we would need, obviously, to supplement these observations by other studies carried out on land. So this is my suggestion, and I see, I think, that this type of assessments could help us move faster and the uh, post-2020 framework. So Ludovic, what do you think? Do you have any reactions? Maybe we can elaborate on what has been said. So there's a lot to say, obviously. And uh, so we need to break silos and uh, mobilize the players. So what is the position of the UICN? You provided a very technology-based answer with satellites, but you also mentioned local partners. Is uh, that unrealistic? So here's a question for Gilles. Uh, do you think that this type of project can be a source of motivation for funding agencies? We have enough knowledge to take action. We always want to study, to acquire knowledge, and it's fair and it's true that this is a really complex subject, but we don't have time to wait for more information. We uh, need to mobilize our resources. We have uh, good practices in agroecology. We have uh, uh, enough knowledge, but we need to implement our knowledge on the field. We already have practices that are uh, promoting biodiversity. So we are uh, we, we are not talking about uh, unrealistic uh, uh, concepts. So all we need now is to go. Uh, 
further with adequate funding and we need to shift the focus of politicians in the right direction. And that's what Jean-Francois said. If we want food systems to improve in the field of biodiversity, because food systems and biodiversity are connected, we need to work together and to develop comprehensive tools that politicians and citizens will support. We need to uh, show that specific, if we manage to prove that specific types of food have a negative impact on nature, or that uh, specific types of food uh, contribute to the loss of biodiversity, well, that's a powerful tool to uh, make a change in, this, uh, in the food systems. The AFT uh, allocates funding to a sustainable uh, agriculture in uh, that's a priority so this agri the funded agriculture must also be climate resilient and uh, must be uh, uh, also respectful must respect uh, biodiversity there's agribusiness there, some agribusiness also try to protect biodiversity, but I will I won't go into details. Now we just need to open our eyes, and s agriculture is the first factor of loss of habitats, and this loss of natural habitats is the first uh, factor of uh, biodiversity erosion, main reason for biodiversity erosion. So. Uh, will the parcel system be enough? I do not think so. And we need to remember that the interface between uh, farming, uh, production, no matter what the scale, so this interface has three levels. There is the parcel and the farm. There's many things to do uh, at this uh, level because we've got a research capacity at the moment uh, for this level. So I think the uh, UICN has enough knowledge, but we do have people who have a good take on uh, agriculture and farming systems, on uh, wild parcels, on linear agriculture. We uh, know how we can build and uh, enhance biodiversity in the landscape. We know how to act with the farming tools we already have. We fund a forest in the north of Gabon. So we have different projects. We uh, take actions, but there is another scale on which we can act, the uh, global uh, scale with millions of uh, people, billions of people will have to feed uh, in the future. There are uh, bad practices in around the world in uh, farming, and so we have many uh, challenges uh, to respond to. We cannot uh, do everything at the same time. So we have to focus on the core of the issue and so there are three different scales to consider. Some organizations, some teams are better equipped for a specific scale. Some teams and institutes have more knowledge on specific biodiversity hotspots. So why uh, couldn't we uh, elaborate and draft a, a global strategy with these different stakeholders? And as, uh, as, as for the field of landscape, there's a science available. We need to act at the political level, but it is quite tricky. And now for the uh, parcel, for parcels, I am a little bit more optimistic because we have more uh, tools and more knowledge about parcels. Thank you very much.
I just wanted to re remind you of uh, climate. It is true that we have uh, we're equipped, we're well equipped at the international level, but we are not that well equipped at the level of uh, parcels. As for parcels, so there, there, there's a lot of work to do on this level. So just a few words to uh, conclude with uh, this uh, round table has uh, uh, taught me and uh, like everything we said yesterday has taught me that we need to keep on uh, uh, mobilizing knowledge, mobilizing uh, partners and politicians. We uh, need to exchange our point of views and like, without being afraid of being challenged by someone who has more knowledge than you, thirdly, we need to uh, to uh, to work on the levels we know well and let experts work on the levels they know well. And we must ensure the continuity of scales. We need to coordinate them. It seems, it sounds really tricky, but it's possible. So we need to work together along with our different partners. We have many assets and we need to coordinate them to win. And everybody must win. It should be an inclusive victory. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking part in this session. And see you soon. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for being here with us. I am a scientific journalist, I'm Yves Siema, and I have the delight of being the moderator of this roundtable this evening, organized by the Ministry of the um, Transition, Biodiversity Transition. So some changes have changed uh, in the eyes of scientists. This is a One Health approach now which people are being tending to adopt. And, and it's a holistic approach to human health, animal health, uh, breed, there's a livestock health, and also the health of ecosystems. There are three areas that have offer, operated separately for a long, long time. And uh, the scientists in each silo would rarely talk to the others. But let me talk, give me, let me introduce you to the uh, presence to the people in this uh, round table. Berenger Abba, who's a member of the French government, she's in, she's the Secretary of State in charge of the ecological transition. We have Wanda Marketa, who is with us via Zoom. She's in South Africa, in Pretoria. She's a virologist, and she's the director of the Viral Zoonosis Center in Pretoria, and she's co-president of the group of high-level experts for the One Health Approach, OLEP. She's also involved in uh, research projects in Zimbabwe. I have Benjamin Roche also up here on the stage to my left. He's a biologist and he is a research director at the IRD. He's a member of the scientific committee of uh, the French Health Service and he's a, uh, an expert member of the pandemics and biodiversity report written by the IPPS. He's also involved in the Prezod initiative, which we'll be talking about in a minute. We have Christina Romanelli also with us, who works on questions of biodiversity, climate change, and public health for the World Health Organization. And she has been involved in that program about uh, biodiversity and health with the CBD. And we will have a few words from Jean-Luc Angou in the room with us here today. He's the General Inspector of Veterinary Health, and he is working with the government on the Prezod uh, initiative, which I just mentioned a second ago. So, the Secretary of State, the floor is yours to uh, round off my introduction. Thank you very much. I really am delighted uh, to be included in this round table, quite simply because a few years ago, when I was an MP, I worked on the Sustainable Development Committee on these questions of uh, environmental health. And we had a lot of difficulty finding partners to work with from the ministers would show us to another ministry, either the health or the uh, agriculture ministry or international affairs. and. Uh, now that we've got our eco ecological transition ministry, that means that we've got a great partner and many 
partners in um, the healthcare sector have found it difficult to group together. But uh, environmental health is a subject which was taken into account very, very late, in fact. Only recently has it been taken into account in uh, the French, in France's uh, national plan for health and the environment in its fourth version. And it's, uh, people have become aware of it all of a sudden and uh, that was due to the uh, pandemic that we're all experiencing right now, I think. And this awareness has triggered uh, extensions to research projects to include environmental health. So we've got One Health, that's a concept which has been developed uh, internationally. And thank heavens today, we are getting scientific light shed on the subject. Uh, the scientists have told us that pathogens are present in animals and uh, they are involved in three quarters of emerging diseases. We've got scientific reports from uh, the IPCC and others which have highlighted that link between uh, the health of animals, the environment and human beings uh, given the different uh, uh, climatic crises that we're experiencing. And so I we are awareness now, the politicians now are starting to get on board with this idea and I'm sure we have a lot of work left to do to try and leave these silos we've been working in and to work between the ministers, ministries, that's something which is really important to us and so um, when we're asked to be coherent, when public policies are to become more coherent, then I think that gives us a wonderful uh, playing field. So I'll come back to that. But in a short while, since January, uh, the One Planet Summit really did put on the table uh, these questions. And we're talking about them here, of course, and uh, they are being addressed in other events tomorrow, for example, there has been a one a high uh, level council for One Health, which has been founded. We've also got the Prezod initiative here in France, which combines researchers on a research program which is directed uh, with uh, funding. We are starting to see, I believe, uh, some uh, mobilization, which is uh, national and international. and we are starting to find this holistic approach to rise to these challenges. Thank you very much, Berenger Abba. Now, before we get down to the nitty gritty, we are going to hear a recorded uh, speech from France's health minister, Olivier Véran. So let's see if uh, the Chers toutes et tous, c'est avec un grand plaisir evening, et beaucoup d'intérêt que je m'associe à vous aujourd'hui dans le cadre de cette soirée santé de la biosphère, des animaux et des hommes. Cette soirée se tient dans un contexte particulier, celui de la pandémie Covid-19, qui a fait réémerger des interrogations sur notre rapport au vivant et qui nous rappelle le lien étroit entre santé humaine, santé animale et santé de l'environnement. Nous le savons, l'homme, de par son impact sur la biodiversité, l'érosion des écosystèmes et le climat, a une responsabilité non négligeable dans l'origine de nouvelles transmissions d'infections virales, zoonotiques et émergentes. La fréquence d'apparition des épidémies associées s'est ainsi accrue au cours des 30 dernières années. Par ailleurs, il est aujourd'hui considéré que 75% des nouvelles maladies infectieuses humaines qui apparaissent chaque année sont d'origine animale et impliquent pour une bonne partie la faune sauvage. Ces risques ne doivent pas nous faire oublier que la biodiversité contribue considérablement à notre santé, notamment par la fourniture de nourriture, de médicaments, d'espaces naturels favorisant notre bien-être physique et mental. Il nous faut mieux valoriser ces services écosystémiques et ces solutions fondées sur la nature. Le récent rapport de l'atelier Pandémie et biodiversité de la plateforme intergouvernementale scientifique et politique sur la biodiversité et les services écosystémiques a également établi que la prévention et la réduction des risques pandémiques sont 100 fois moins coûteuses que la réponse à ces crises. Outre cet argument économique, investir dans la prévention des pandémies est crucial pour éviter les souffrances humaines que nous déplorons depuis le début de la crise Covid-19. Les défis à relever au plan national et international en matière de santé et environnement concernent tous les secteurs d'activité, que ce soit l'agriculture, l'énergie, le logement, les transports, l'industrie, 
mais également les secteurs en charge de la santé humaine, vétérinaire ou de la protection des végétaux. Permettre à tous de vivre en bonne santé et promouvoir le bien-être de tous à tout âge d'ici 2030, c'est un des objectifs de développement durable des Nations Unies pour lequel nous devons redoubler d'efforts. La France participe depuis de nombreuses années et tout particulièrement depuis 2021 à la mise en place de plusieurs initiatives visant à renforcer la compréhension, la prévention, la surveillance et la riposte face aux risques de pandémie. Elle a rappelé à ce titre son attachement à la prise en compte de l'approche « Une seule santé » dans la réforme de l'architecture en santé mondiale. Je voudrais rappeler que fin 2020, lors du Forum de Paris sur la paix, la France a proposé avec l'Allemagne la création d'un panel d'experts de haut niveau pour l'approche « Une seule santé ». Ce panel a vu le jour en mai dernier. Il rendra ses premières recommandations dès cet automne. Nous en prendrons connaissance et nous élaborerons nos politiques à la lumière de ces conclusions. Également, le 11 janvier dernier, s'est tenue la quatrième édition du One Planet Summit, dédiée aux enjeux de protection de la biodiversité. Ce sommet a regroupé autour du président de la République, des chefs d'État et de gouvernement, ainsi que des leaders d'organisations internationales, d'institutions financières, du secteur économique, d'organisations non gouvernementales. Tous se sont dit prêts à accélérer l'action internationale en faveur de la nature et à prendre des engagements pour enrayer la perte rapide de biodiversité. Ce sommet a permis de lancer l'initiative PRESAD qui vise à opérationnaliser l'approche « Une seule santé » au travers d'un réseau pluridisciplinaire. Il s'agit de mettre en place une coopération inédite à l'échelle internationale entre les acteurs de la recherche et ceux des réseaux de vigilance sanitaire pour la prévention de nouvelles pandémies issues de réservoirs animaux. Lancé par trois instituts de recherche français, le Centre de coopération internationale en recherche agronomique pour le développement, l'Institut national de recherche pour l'agriculture, l'alimentation et l'environnement, et l'Institut de recherche pour le développement. Et en concertation avec de nombreux acteurs de la recherche, l'initiative mobilise aujourd'hui déjà plus de 1000 chercheurs et acteurs de la santé humaine, animale et environnementale dans 50 pays. Nous, nous nous sommes également engagés à renforcer notre soutien à l'approche « Une seule santé » en la plaçant au centre de nos travaux et de la coopération européenne en santé. Nous utilisons avec succès cette approche depuis de nombreuses années pour lutter contre la résistance des bactéries aux antibiotiques ou antibiorésistances, qui est une de mes priorités parce qu'elle menace l'efficacité des antibiotiques et elle coûte de nombreuses vies chaque année. Il existe ainsi un plan d'action européen sur le sujet, avec une déclinaison sous forme de feuille de route interministérielle depuis 2016 en France. En France également, nous avons créé le 1er janvier dernier, avec le ministère de l'Enseignement supérieur et de la Recherche et de l'Innovation, une nouvelle agence de recherche sur les maladies infectieuses émergentes qui travaille selon l'approche One Health, avec notamment une ouverture sur la société civile, les milieux associatifs, les réseaux de soins et de recherche. Cette agence autonome de l'Institut national de la santé et de la recherche médicale a pour mission le financement, la coordination et l'animation de la recherche sur les maladies infectieuses comme le VIH-Sida ou la tuberculose, mais également sur les émergences dont les fièvres hémorragiques virales, les arboviraux ou bien sûr la Covid-19. En parallèle de cette agence de recherche, il existe depuis 2018 un programme prioritaire de recherche One Health sur l'antibiorésistance. Le gouvernement travaille aussi à l'élaboration d'une stratégie nationale d'accélération sur les maladies infectieuses émergentes. Cette stratégie doit notamment permettre de mieux comprendre, prévenir et contrôler les phénomènes d'émergence ou de réémergence des maladies infectieuses. Ainsi, en mars dernier, une consultation publique et un appel à manifestation d'intérêt ont été lancés en vue de mettre en place de futurs appels à projets sur ces thématiques d'intérêt. Le ministère de la Santé mène également depuis 2004 une politique ambitieuse afin de réduire l'impact des altérations de l'environnement sur la santé en collaboration avec le ministère de l'écologie et l'ensemble des ministères. Cette collaboration a abouti à quatre plans nationaux santé-environnement qui nous ont permis de progresser en matière de prévention et de, ré et de réduction des risques sanitaires, de territorialisation des enjeux de santé-environnement et des enjeux de recherche. Le quatrième plan national santé-environnement, paru en mai dernier, vise à poursuivre l'objectif de mieux préserver l'avenir de l'espèce humaine et plus largement celui du monde animal et des écosystèmes dont nous sommes dépendants. 
Avec ce plan, la France s'engage dans une approche intégrée, unifiée de la santé publique, animale et environnementale, autour de l'approche Une seule santé. Ainsi, ce plan Un environnement, une santé contient plusieurs actions qui visent par exemple à surveiller la santé de la faune terrestre, à approfondir les connaissances scientifiques et celles des professionnels sur les liens entre l'environnement et la santé, à prévenir les impacts sanitaires de certaines espèces animales et végétales ou encore à informer les propriétaires d'animaux sur l'utilisation des produits biocides. Enfin, le ministère des Solidarités et de la Santé est également impliqué dans l'élaboration de la troisième stratégie nationale pour la biodiversité qui sera prochainement publiée. Notre volonté est que chacun à son niveau puisse agir pour un environnement favorable à toutes les santés. Les acteurs de la santé, par exemple, font d'ores et déjà évoluer leurs pratiques médicales, prenant concrètement en compte ces liens entre biodiversité et santé. C'est pourquoi la mobilisation de tous toutes les échelles de territoire est essentielle. Elle constitue une condition de réussite de l'ensemble des actions mises en œuvre autour de l'approche One Health. Je vous souhaite à toutes et tous une excellente table ronde et je vous invite à poursuivre ces travaux et vos contributions en faveur de l'approche Une seule santé. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. And then we will wrap up uh, with um, uh, a drink afterwards, so you're invited to a cocktail at the end. So to start the ball rolling on the observations, I think we should look at a small, a short video which has been prepared by the IPPBS when it wrote its 2020 report on the pandemic and on biodiversity. What are the causes of pandemics such as COVID-19? Oh. Almost all pandemics fall over. And 70% of emerging pandemics are of animal origin. This video illustrated many interesting uh, ideas. So, Christina Romanelli, you um, work at the WHO and you are in a good place to uh, see uh, zoonotics. So, now we are uh, um, in a pandemic. So, what's happening with infectious diseases? Can you hear me? And that's a really interesting question. First of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting the WHO at this roundtable. These challenges are the basis uh, of, for the human health and the health of the planet. That's the reason why I'm delighted to be here tonight with you, Madam Secretary, and as well as with all the other guests. 
DWHO has taken part in the revision of the EPBES report that has made this video and that shows it is pressing, it is urgent, we face this challenge, uh, the infectious diseases challenge. This uh, challenge is at the very heart of the health risk we're facing today, and uh, we, would, we could have to face them again very soon. It is uh, fair to say that we have entered a pandemic era where we, uh, uh, we we pay the price for our destructive activities. Our activities uh, are uh, an increasing impact on the health of the planet and on biodiversity. And uh, beyond the COVID-19 pandemics, infectious disease uh, affect billions of people uh, yearly and um, two thirds of infectious diseases or emerging infectious diseases that is uh, new uh, diseases uh, caused by uh, pathogenic agents mutating and they could be uh, so transmitted as a risk of transmission and of pandemics. So why have we chosen to act on this uh, field? So Madam Secretary and Madam Minister have uh, said it before, uh, more than 70% of emerging diseases are zoonotic, uh, meaning that they come from the animals. This report as well as many other uh, scientific reports uh, show that our practices, our activities are have a destructive effect, and there are uh, the main causes of uh, emerging diseases, and they could also interact with uh, climate change. We could then we could then enter a positive feedback loop. I am sorry, I, I use English too, but. Uh, this uh, virtual circle, these uh, factors that could also increase the risk of emerging zoonotic infectious diseases. Zoonotics have been very well documented over the year since the pandemic in 1918 pandemic that affected more than 500 million people. So we have seen different forms of uh, influenza and bird flus and there are also other zoonotic emerging diseases, the Hendra, MERS, SARS and so on. There are many of them. Indeed, until today, we have identified over 200 types of zoonotics. And now we know that we have modified our uh, ecosystems and we have created an unprecedented, an unprecedented number of uh, uh, conditions that uh, could uh, create, that could uh, promote and facilitate uh, the emergence of infectious, uh, zoonotic infectious diseases. I won't go into details, but over 30 new infectious diseases have appeared in the past 30 years. And if we maintain, if we keep on with this rate, and if we keep on destroying uh, our environment, then we can fairly say that the COVID-19 pandemic is the first of many pandemics. We need more action on the international health care front so we can protect ex present and future generations. I hope I answered the first part of your question. Yes, you did. And now I turn towards Wanda Marcotta, thanks to technology, and I, I, I think that everybody works fine. Wanda, you're a virologist and you've been studying pathogens for a long time. So we know now that zoonotic our disease is transmitted by the animal to a uh, human. So what do we have to do to uh, be protected? And do we know which zoonotics will be the more worrying, the most threatening? I 
Good evening. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. It would have been much nicer to be there in person and join the cocktail event afterwards. But unfortunately, I have to do this virtually. Um, so, so what's the um, pathogens? Is there certain ones that we can worry about? Christina already mentioned some of them. And we tend to look at history. And then based on that history, we look forward and we make certain decisions on what we think is going to be the most dangerous pathogen that's going to cause the next outbreak. And maybe in general, you know, there's a few that we need to watch. I think influenza has always been... Um, one of the pathogens that, that caused pandemics or epidemics. And in the last century, we saw more than six um, of these. And we always worried about the phyloviruses, and this is Ebola. Um, we had this um, huge outbreak in West Africa um, a few years ago that was really worrying. And then recently, we reported the first case of a Marburg human disease in West Africa, again, showing how these diseases... Um, can occur in any geographic region where the reservoirs are present at any time. And then we have all the paramyxoviruses, and, and Christina mentioned Hendra, but there's also Nipah that um, we see sporadic outbreaks of, and we also saw outbreaks in India um, a few, uh, almost a year ago. And then the coronas. I think we all we all worried about coronaviruses at the moment. There's been um, several outbreaks, some of them very mild disease, but then we saw SARS, we saw MERS, and now we saw SARS coronavirus two that causing that's causing the COVID outbreak. And if we look at at, at what's similar with these viruses, they're all RNA viruses, which means they can mutate more rapidly um, because they don't have proofreading ability which means in, in practice they can adapt quick, quicker and those adaptions may be infecting a new species. So we're worried about them. On top of that, viruses like influenza can um, reassort. They've got um, segmented genomes, so they can reassort and all of a sudden if there's a co-infection, a new virus could come out of that cell. Um, coronaviruses we know now can also recombine, so they can um, switch pieces of their genomes. Um, so all these things are things that we want to watch with these viruses. But I think what we also need to recognize is some of the scientists tell us there's more than 1.7 million viruses that we don't even know about. Half a million of these can spill over. So we also need to be prepared for what we call maybe disease X. And I think that is what some of the previous speakers referred to. We've, we had some surveillance programs in the past. We still have them. But we definitely need more initiatives. And, and Prizo that we heard about also, um, it was mentioned in the previous talks, are one of them. And, and we can discuss that more. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Markota. Benjamin Roche, uh, sorry, you have to be fast. We don't have much time. You have uh, talked about the links between uh, health and e ecosystems. We say that pandemics are linked to the biodiversity crisis. Can you uh, tell us more about uh, which uh, mechanisms uh, can actually uh, support the spread of spreading of diseases? Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. The EPBES report has made a summary of 20-year research in this field, and there are several mechanisms that uh, are involved. We know that most uh, animal uh, species uh, cannot be infected by uh, some uh, virus. And when the, there's a rich biodiversity, uh, such uh, uh, wild species will uh, mitigate the impact of such viruses within ecosystem. So we need to, uh, when there's no dilution, when there's no mitigation, pathogens will develop in ecosystems. And the erosion of biodiversity is also caused by human activities such as deforestation and such activities will uh, push uh, the population towards uh, those uh, pathogens. So that's the uh, perfect equation for the emergence of zoonotics uh, that uh, and, uh, Christina um, talked, uh, mentioned it, said it, and uh, 
uh, the, uh, we uh, move, we travel faster. And so now in this globalized world, uh, a small uh, infection can start as pandemic. As there was the uh, cases of a typical pneumonia in, 19, in 2019, and this uh, turned into a global pandemic. So you can see that there's a kind of uh, phenomenon, those pandemics can be uh, quite a sudden. Before 1900s, there was uh, one pandemic every century. So since 1900, there have been six pandemics, all caused by zoonotics. This threat is uh, here, is happening here, and will happen again. Our report says that there is a link between uh, human activity and nature. So if we don't change that, we could. Uh, we could have a uh, pandemic every 20 years. So we need to go beyond the scientific community and hold a debate with politicians to get a strategy on the local level. Berenger Abal, we talked about the scientific link between biodiversity and the pandemics. Do the politici are the politicians aware of this link? Do uh, they uh, do they still uh, have silos? Do they still think in silos? So we are trying to rebuild the Secretariat for Biodiversity. And that alone shows that we want to uh, consider biodiversity. Rest assured that uh, within the uh, government, there was those who underestimated the impact of this imbalance, imbalances between animals and humans are in, have now changed their mind. And uh, some ministries are a little bit further away from the field we tackle, like the Ministry for Finance. But even the Ministry for Finance has, uh, is now aware uh, that we need to repair these imbalances so uh, that we can be prepared for what uh, could happen in the future. If we don't act, so we need to protect biodiversity, protect our species, and protect ourselves. So this awareness uh, needs uh, an action, a common action between different ministries. We need to work together in a consistent manner. That's, that's the case nowadays uh, in France. So who could have imagined that a minister of health such as Olivier Véran would say such words in the past? And today here we are, we talk about uh, ecosystemic services, we talk about SDGs. So you can see that the, there's an awareness, there's a growing awareness among politicians. And the same goes with the Ministry for Agriculture. Every time we uh, discuss uh, this, and, and the, uh, this awareness uh, is uh, um, also uh, goes the same goes for uh, citizens, for the population. Everybody is more aware of this uh, the theme. So there was a book called La Fabrique des Pandémies, the Factory of uh, uh, Pandemics, uh, and uh, the, the author has also uh, made a documentary, and we have helped uh, her. That, that was quite difficult because it was during the pandemics, but I'm really proud because uh, we want to uh, act, and uh, research, researchers, scientists are here, they're on board, and uh, but everybody uh, must uh, be uh, aware of this above all the citizens that that's how we'll make a change so we mentioned a, we, we talk about a holistic approach i think we have it but there's still a way more to go there's way more to change in the way we work our mps are really active uh, uh, our um, the MP uh, one Marseille MP is really active on this uh, field, so everybody is, is here. Everybody acts. Everybody is aware, and uh, I think that's the only way for us to uh, to uh, move forward. 
the Minister of Health has mentioned a priority uh, research program and uh, with a research department for infectious disease. So we can be optimistic in a way. So now let's turn to uh, science and scientists. And uh, now uh, is now another short video which uh, is a good introduction to our discussion. What can we do to help prevent future pandemics? Scientists say that pandemics are happen more and more often and cost a lot. They're more and more expensive. So I'd like to continue now and turn towards Professor Makwata. Early detection is obviously one of the avenues that are being explored and has an important role to play. What can we do in that field? Um, so I think early detection, it's complicated. You know, if we really think about um, spillover, there's, there's a lot of different things that we need to look at. So we need to look at early detection in humans. You know, if there's, if there's actual spillover and there's already human disease, we need to detect it very quickly. But that is reacting to spillover. And then we've got other aspects where we can look at, at the reservoir species, and that's complicated because they're not getting sick. So this is animals where this pathogen lives in nature that's not getting sick. So where are we going to target it? Um, what animals are we going to target? And then we've got intermediate or amplifying hosts that also sometimes play a role in the spillover process. So, so I think early detection in, in all of these scenarios are key. But I think in my perspective, also from one out and listening to some of the conversations, it needs to go past or further than just pathogen detection. And that is where One Health is truly in action, you know, really looking at spillover factors, bringing the environment in, bringing human behavior in, and target early detection really where there's risk, um, and trying to address this from that perspective. Um, and that is that really requires not just different ministries, but also different levels of society and going back to communities and understanding what's really going on on the ground and not just looking for pathogens. Um, and that, that will be a true one off approach. Thank you. So above and beyond early detection, Benjamin Roche, a lot of our ecosystemic practices are dangerous. So what can we do? I believe that the first point really is to make deep change. Uh, we have so far waited until the pathogen crosses over into humans and then we develop uh, treatments and uh, uh, solutions. Of course, it is important to be as prepared as possible. It's important not to uh, put different approaches up against one another. They can live side by side, but it's important to uh, intervene upstream to develop early detection uh, protocols, 
and that's what the Presod initiative is going to do. It wants to uh, ward off the arrival of zoonosis, but it's also a question of uh, overseeing the change in hosts so that we can detect as quickly as possible when uh, the virus goes from the animal to the man. It's uh, important to understand how we can develop strategies for managing social, social ecosystems that would make them resilient to the emergence of zoonosis, whilst at the same time uh, including these local populations and to enable them to have a uh, decent living standard. So there are the two goals of the Prezode initiative, and the, uh, go the goal is based on science, of course. There is a lack of scientific knowledge about what we should be doing, what is the best solution. So we really do need to carry out research on that theme. And there are initiatives which are on the ground, and they really have to be rolled out in a sustainable manner. This is not something which you can roll out for two months and then you just stop and you, you think about something else. It has to be sustainable. You have to un it has to be understood and accepted. And that's why one of the important Prezod approaches is to co-construct. We have uh, got some co-construction workshops in 11 regions of the world. There are over, over a thousand researchers in 50 countries who are involved in these co-construction workshops to identify what we can use, what the levers are, what can be implemented to be able to adopt and deploy in the field. Thank you. In the room we have Jean-Luc Angot with us, who works for the French government and he works on the Prozard project. Perhaps he could say a few more words to us about uh, this very ambitious project. Well, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Indeed, we have seen how important the link is between the animal kingdom and uh, pandemics with zoonosis. We have seen how important prevention is too, obviously, as well as preparation, as has already been said. Working on prevention is, is key. And also, there's the One Health concept, which uh, is interdisciplinary, and uh, that has to cover research also, which is why these three uh, organizations have created the initiative here in France, which is uh, intended to become international, to create uh, a scientific platform for data exchange, setting up a, a platform for knowledge exchange and a resource center. And we have to expand these activities beyond the local scale or the national or the regional scale, they, although they are very uh, important. We also have to look internationally, What's why, which is why, in the, why tomorrow we're going to be organizing a meeting with a certain number of countries. Some countries have already signed up our movement, they signed a declaration of intent. We've got 15 or so countries who said they're interested, uh, and we'll see that tomorrow, alongside the four international organizations that are already involved. And we really hope that we will be able to spread the concept Concept out. We don't want to impose measures, as Benjamin Rocha said, we have to co-construct and it's going to be a long job, but what we really want is for this work to be long-lasting and uh, we, so that we can prevent future pandemics. Thank you very much. So let's talk about uh, implementation now. To give a concrete aspect to this, we're going to hand the floor to Fabrice Jolin, who's with us here today, working at the PNR and the Golf de Morbihan up in um, Brittany. Thank you for being with us here. Can you just tell us a little bit what this means to you when you're locally promoting One Health? Well, thank you very much for giving me the mic. Uh, my experience is very on a very modest scale, but regional, uh, Nat regional nature parks are outdoor laboratories and we have been working on uh, territory and health. We had a seminar with which we, during which we worked with a consultant who said that uh, he was very happy to be talking to healthcare specialists. We were a bit uh, gobsmacked when we heard that because uh, um, we didn't feel that we were really that we thought, well, well, how can you call us a healthcare specialist? But when we started analysing what we do out in the territory, then we 
of course, protect biodiversity, and we've also set up data uh, sheets to help our local elected representatives. And one of those uh, data sheets was to do with uh, health, with healthcare, uh, and heat waves, uh, and the mountains, etc. And so uh, we've also addressed the question of. Uh, coastal erosion and storms, which can generate stress. So our town planning um, decisions can have an impact on health. And it's important to work with our local population. So we've got what we've launched, family challenges for biodiversity. So we've got eight regional nature parks that are involved. Ours is focusing on health. We are carrying out different initiatives and we are inviting people to uh, spend a little bit of time in nature, to relax in nature, to uh, have a look at their own microbiota because that's also part of nature. So we try to uh, use different uh, approaches. We are going to recruit a project manager for the One Health work that we carry out and their target will be to create a common culture, including doctors, real healthcare professionals, if you like, associations, counsellors, and then to divine, devise a, an action plan which we will deploy, which we will include in our action plan, because we review our action plan every three years. Thank you very much. So if there's some take-home message for from this evening, it's that the environment is uh, to be taken care of by healthcare uh, specialists. Christina Romanelli, if I could speak to you now. Uh, you, the World Health Organization, you've been uh, involved in, in this for many years. So what's going on in, in the kitchens in Geneva? What's cooking? Indeed, the World Health Organization has been working for over a decade on the theme of One Health. And there's a lot of things in the pipeline, but I'm going to try and focus just on a few of those things. So we have been working on, well, the first project in 2010, as you may well know, we had a tripartite allegiance formed with the uh, FAO of the United Nations, along with the OIE, which is the health, the animal health organization. And we joined health uh, school forces with them. And working with them, we've learned a lot We've had some successful projects, and we've also learnt a few lessons from our mistakes, particularly in terms of uh, managing zoonoses, uh, uh, rabies, bird flu, and all the rest of it. The system that was set up back then was not perfect, it still is not perfect, but we really are working hard to improve it as a collaborative platform. But I would like to stress that of the many lessons we have learned from COVID-19, one of the major things that we have learned is that we were able to assess the fact that in the past we would assess animal and human interactions uh, quite successfully. However, we often forgot to monitor interactions in the ecosystem system and assess risks. So we are currently changing that. We're rectifying the situation. First of all, we're broadening our partnership from three parties. We're going to include uh, the United Nations uh, Programme for the Environment, so the UNEP, which will reinforce in a more balanced manner the three existing pillars of One Health. So not only on an international scale, but we're also talking about regional and national scales as well, all the way down to the local scale. So it's a technical partnership with UNEP is already up and running. 
including on a regional basis. All we need to do now is to formalise the, the legal status of the, of the whole thing and all of the details. On top of that, working with uh, the three original agencies, but thanks to leadership from France, we have also, this year, in the month of May, established a high-level committee of experts. It's called the OLEP, O-H-H-L-E-P. The, the name may not be very sexy, I admit. But uh, we've also got a new group of experts on biodiversity, climate change, and One Health that the WHO is co-running with the UCM. So we don't only prevent zoonosis, uh, so we, uh, we, we, we don't only work on links between biodiversity and health on one side and then on the links, biodiversity and animal health on the other side. So we're trying to have a holistic approach. Following a call for actions carried out by many health professionals last year, the WHO has, has, uh, called, has issued a call for action to the international community in order to prevent and to reduce our vulnerability if uh, new pandemics, new health emergencies were to rise. So is it enough uh, for me to uh, tell you that there are uh, six main uh, basic uh, pillars. There's a lot to talk about, so please read uh, this uh, document. And uh, finally, uh, we also work with uh, countries so we can draft a new international treaty to respond to future pandemics and we want to uh, to uh, use new health tools especially uh, new international health regulations our objective is that even if the uh, who would be the uh, would lay the foundation of this uh, of this initiative. There will be other partner organisations. As you can see, there's a lot to talk about as uh, for One Health. Thank you very much, Berenger Abba. Do you want to comment uh, uh, on what's going on at the international level? Yes, uh, I will uh, conclude building a bridge with the international, building a bridge between the international and local level. Mr. Jolin, congratulations on this uh, report. Uh, I am delighted at this uh, uh, new awareness, a new awareness we should find in all new policies. Because if we uh, protect uh, our areas, we can protect the species that uh, live in them, and that's uh, what uh, the that's what we do when we fight against a deforestation because of for deforestation animal species get closer to humankind and that's uh, uh, what uh, we do we fight deforestation we fight uh, this uh, phenomenon we fight in all our policy in all the ministries uh, policy we try to uh, build a bridge between the local and the international level because we live in a globalized world. We try to raise awareness and uh, to uh, take action by, uh, with, uh, by and allocating uh, significant fundings. And now we try to make a link between the different stakeholders that uh, uh, in the different fields. So that's an ambitious program an ambitious plan but I am very optimistic because I know uh, that uh, there's more and more awareness so this is almost the end of this uh, round table so we uh, said we wouldn't uh, uh, we wouldn't uh, tackle the issue of the pandemics in of biodiversity separately we have mentioned many initiatives I will not mention them again. So what now, what 
What do you take home from this roundtable? Well, Christina, do you want to start? I said we have entered the era of pandemics, but we are about to enter the era of opportunities, an unprecedented era of opportunities. But in order to achieve that, we need to uh, to have the necessary conditions for uh, success, for being successful. So let me sum up my thought in one sentence. I think it all depends uh, upon how we can speed up our actions. It depends on our will to take political decisions based on science. We need interdisciplinary measures so we can ripe the co-benefits across the different affected sectors, sectors that are affected. So we need to follow the example set by France and we have to invest in prevention because now only 3% uh, of the global budget is allocated to prevention. 97% of, of the budget is allocated, is dedicated to a response. And we know that response measures are 100 times more expensive, so we can make it together. Thank you for being so optimistic. Uh, Professor Marcotin, Wanda, can you what's what do you take home from this round table? So I think um, one thing is we don't want to sit here again in two years and, and talk about another pandemic and we didn't do anything. So I think prevention is really important. Um, it's not just about being prepared when it's in the human population and prevention is a big picture. Um, it really needs to look at spillover factors, not just pathogen detection. And we shouldn't just say, oh, this is the factors. We should start addressing it. We should put resources into things like biodiversity protection, like land use changes. There's definite economic value in addressing those issues, not just in terms of pandemic prevention, but also just to have a healthier planet and in the end, healthier humans, animals, and environment. So from my side, that, that will be my perspective. I think the word prevention has been uh, repeated and mentioned several times, right? Uh, I think that what I'm going to say will resonate with Wanda said. We have uh, said that there are more and more zoonoses uh, emerging, more and more uh, damage being done to our planet. So we need to show that we can uh, uh, generate uh, long-lasting solutions, uh, international uh, long-lasting solutions, and we need to act together to exchange information. We can't do things on our side. And we will uh, reach our uh, objective is we, imp we improve the uh, dialogue, the interaction, the exchanges between the states and the population. We know that uh, sometimes uh, the, uh, we have our share of responsibility in the scientific uh, community. There's a lot of work to do, like science has to get closer to uh, the population, to a certain uh, uh, walks of life, so we can be more prepared. So po the population can be uh, more uh, is uh, will uh, listen, and we uh, face a global uh, problem, and we need to act together to avoid another uh, COVID-19 pandemics. So here we are tonight. We have uh, initiated a dialogue. We will pursue it, um, Madam Secretary of State. So what do I take home? Well, I uh, I hope we will manage to have long-lasting solutions and we will uh, support uh, nature-based solutions. And uh, I would uh, like these uh, solutions, these measures to be integrated with the uh, political sphere because the political sphere is really slow in responding to the challenges that so we need to integrate this new dimension in our current debate. Thank you very much. 
So please give a round of applause to our guests. They have said very important uh, things. They uh, shared their thoughts with us. So please uh, don't go home yet. You uh, stay with us. If you're interested in One Health, you can stay and uh, take part in this uh, little uh, little celebration. We're going to a cocktail uh, is uh, going to happen now. Thank you for your attention.